Hello, everyone. It's nice to have you all here. Can everybody in the room hear me? Is that working fine? OK. So welcome. We're excited. First, I'm David. I'll be your host tonight and throughout the event. If you have anything, any problems, anything, hit me up. I'll be here. So first, again, I want to welcome you to the first Designathon ever in Switzerland. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to have you here, to see so many of you in this room. Um, if there's anyone in the other room, we have a live stream into the other room, you can come over, it's fine. We're not so many people. <laughs> Actually, I think there's a minute delay, so they might come in a minute. Um, so right, um, what is this going to look like, this event? In exactly 48 hours, we'll be done. In 48 hours, this event will conclude, and you guys will have been working 48 hours to win the design -a Award. You will be doing so in teams of two to four people. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> but don't worry, pre-made teams, you can form together. But also, we'll have single people here, and we hope we can get some new formations of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams too. We'll be doing that in the upcoming break, speed brainstorming sessions. You will have 90 seconds, and we adjusted that from a minute, so it's not a classical elevator pitch, but you'll have 90 seconds to present your idea, your concept, your product at the end of the event. You'll be competing for those four prizes, best in design autonomy, best in social impact, best in future, and best in fresh and crazy. Best in Design Atom is sponsored by Microsoft Surface. We have 3,000 francs for the winning team and the Microsoft Surface 3 for each team member. That comes with a keyboard and a pen and is kind of a tablet and a laptop in one. So the other prizes are Best in Future, Oxa Vintertour, um, sponsored that, and it's 500 francs. Then we'll have Social Impact, which is going to be four Freitag bags, um, sponsored by Freitag. And lastly, we have Fresh and Crazy, which is again sponsored by Microsoft Surface, and is another 500 francs. So, what will you do? You will find, you will have ideas, you'll have good ideas, fresh ideas, you'll have crazy ideas, and what we hope, hope most, you have bold ideas. So, the schedule for tonight will look like this. We're already behind, but never mind. Um, I will go ahead with a welcome and a bit of security, sorry about that, um, and introduction into the knowledge fair. Then we'll have the design process by Tuli Utriainen. From, she's from the Idea Square in CERN. And then, we'll go into the topic, and I will give a brief over, overview what the topic will be. And then, what I'm really excited about is the speed brainstorming and team building session. So be ready to get a bit of interactivity into this room. Um, then we will have a quick break, you can get some refreshments, and most importantly, you will have to sign up in your teams. So you register at the starting desk with your team. After the break, we will have a talk and an introduction into company culture and workplace designed by Google by Sascha Haag and by Lukas Stolwig. After that, we will have Ramon, a student from the ZTDK, um, who will be presenting his bachelor thesis on digital nomadism. Following that, we'll have a brief tour through innovation and the dilemma of acceleration in our society by Stefan Pops from The Wire magazine. And lastly, Tuli and me, we will do a quick wrap-up, and then you're free to go to the opera and work. So I just want to take a moment to thank all our sponsors. It wouldn't have been possible without that. We are so glad to have both financial sponsors, location sponsors, and of course, drinks and food but also we have partners who supported us, us in this location. So, 
the briefly announced security briefing. Um, yeah, I tried to make it funny, so I hope this is a bit, uh, at least a bit enjoyable. Um, this is the number you have to call if anything really goes wrong, like really wrong, so if you lose a leg or anything. This is really the, don't call the police or the fire department or whatever you're gonna ha make happen here directly. Um, call this number, they're available 24 seven and they will dispatch your emergency call. If, however, it's only a broken stool leg or something else, you might wanna call this number. We're available too, 24 seven, and it's the team, the Designaton team. So if you have a jammed print or anything or a question, call this. Even if you're stuck in an elevator, maybe. That could work too. Um, seriously, don't be afraid to call this number. We're here for you. Um, now, I just want to quickly go into the building. Um, we're here, right? I hope no one is in here, but I hope we're here, all of us. Um, this starting desk is going to be occupied 24-7, so you can really always come here if anything goes wrong. Um, and then, this is the current floor we're on, and then we might want to go up to where you'll be the whole weekend, mostly. This is the working area, and in this working area, you'll, we call it Werkstatt, um, you'll be doing most of your work, I think, and of, of your thinking, too. Um, we also have an adjacent room to the working area, which is the knowledge fair. Here we'll be having workshops the whole Saturday. We have a relax relaxing area. This is where you can have catch up and relax a bit and also catch up on some, on some sleep. Um, we also have a material shop. This might come in handy if you need paper, cardboard, wood even. This is where to get it. Okay, so, um, right, this is the third floor, and the working area from the inside looks like this. I hope it will be, look like this too, or even crazier, we don't know yet. Um, but if we go back, this is the overview, and now we're descending a floor lower. And this is what you just saw. This area is like the main <coughs> action part. Um, we have a lot of um, working spaces here, down here, so if you, I think you'll be safe if you work somewhere around here and go here for, for the heavy lifting. Um, lastly, the most important part, food. Food is down here. You will have to go to the second floor, which is the ground floor, funnily enough, um, and you will have to follow that corridor to the Viaduktraum for those who are from the ZDK, but you cannot enter from the outside. You can only get here from the inside. There you have it, buffet, it's Halvala really, and it will be really nice. Um, yes, so just one last thing. This is the main entrance. At night you will only be able to enter this, this entrance. The whole building will be closed on all other, other entrances. Okay, some more security. Um, no smoking in the whole building. I mean, that, this is really a given one. Um, but also, don't block doors. If you, if you block doors for too long, some of them at least, an alarm will go off. And that's something we should avoid. And the most important thing, this is like really the most important thing, don't trigger the sprinklers, the fire sprinklers. That's a fire sprinkler. Don't do it. <laughs> it's nothing to hang up stuff. It's nothing to, you know, don't play ball. Go outside, please, please. Because if any one of those, any of those goes off, we have like 2,000 liters through one of them in a minute. So the whole building is flooded, and ultimately, the event is over. Okay. Just, in the end, just be nice. Um, I have to say this. Don't leave your things unattended unattended and take care. You, you are responsible of your belongings. But in the end, just be nice. I mean, <laughs> so 
All of this is to be found on this site. We put an info part on the website. You will not find it on the actual site. You'll find it through this URL. So before I go on, this is your key to everything. Keep it always on you, on your person. You need this to enter anything. At night, we won't leave you inside. And uh, so, yeah, important. Right, and so next part, Knowledge Fair. I was talking about this earlier. Um, we'll have workshops throughout Saturday in this room right above the working area. And this is really not single one-way talk, one-way talks, but more of an interactive workshop. So you can come there and get feedback. You can get some advice on the current state of your work. Do this, it's really important. So as a first speaker tomorrow is Lawrence Toll. He'll be presenting creat creativity techniques at Saturday, tomorrow at nine. Maybe you want to come up quickly? Sorry. Does it work? I guess, yeah. Welcome everybody. Again, I'm Lawrence Stroll and I would like to introduce you the workshop Creative Techniques. And tomorrow we will get to know a bunch of methods. So it's a bunch of more sheets and sheets and more sheets to find exactly the right way to solve your, your problem, like to activate your ideas and to find or to get a unique solution for your problem you're working on. And so there are different steps. We're analyzing your question. I saw there are a lot of questions on the, on the website. So, but I would like to, to um, make them your question, like to deconstruct um, the question you're working on. And we'd like to adopt your problem, finding your own approach and transform it to find your way through this. Yeah, thanks. That's it. So tomorrow at nine, be there. Um, as the next guest, we'll have the electronic lab, which is technically not in the knowledge fair itself, but right below it. And it's... Uh... <laughs> so I guess I'm talking in Moritz's modeling. Uh, I'm Luke. Um, we're both uh, working in research and teaching in the field of interaction design at the Set Hardika, and we're available for most of the day tomorrow between 10 and 6 o'clock to help you develop your prototypes, develop your concepts, uh, particularly in the area of interaction design and working with electronic devices. So we can assist you with materials and also with advice of working electronics. Um, they are working here, by the way. Uh. Yes. Uh, so we'll be here the whole day tomorrow, or 10 to 6, uh, and it's right next to your workplace where you'll be working in the workshop. So uh, we're here to assist you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Right, and on after lunch on, at 13 o'clock, we'll have Martin Simper. Maybe you want to introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, well, it will be more a consultation uh, a face-to-face -face consultation, and the and the focus is on storytelling. So maybe uh, maybe it would be important for the 90 seconds you will have to tell uh, on Sunday to present your ideas and concepts. And maybe I would focus my questions uh, on uh, um, which um, situation of human beings, or maybe of mankind, do you have in mind? Uh, when you think about, uh, when, you, when you create your concepts or your ideas or your products, which moments of change in the life of human beings uh, will be accompanied by your products or ideas or concepts? Uh, which uh, maybe, which conflicts are there, which conflicts are there of maybe with the environment or with nature or with other human beings you would like to solve with your with your uh, product, idea, concept. And at the end, which story do you have to tell about it? Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, okay, then 
Another really important part is uh, the Maker Corner. Um, Roman, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi. Yeah, we have an awesome making co Maker Corner. So if you want to get physical, let's say you want to make something, we have 3D printers, we have cardboard, we have everything that you need. Yes, that's what it looked like. Um, also, um, this is the start of the Designathon trophy. And uh, you can see it live there in printing, like 48 hours. Um, so check it out. And also at two o'clock, I'm gonna um, talk a bit about new tools that you might can use right away. Um, design software, uh, new tools for making something. We have awesome new like uh, CNC wire bender. Um, and also I'm gonna show you a good selection of YouTube videos and make that together to like foresee a little bit the future of how we design probably or something. Okay. Thank you, Roman. And then, as a last talk at five o'clock, we'll be having. Sorry, we'll have we'll be having a really important talk: how to pitch. Um, sadly, Rahel wasn't able to make it today, um, so I'll just briefly try try to summarize. Essentially, you'll have to present your idea. You'll have to sell your idea, and to do that. I would strongly recommend to attend this workshop. It's how to pitch your idea. This will be really well relevant to Sunday. Right. Okay, so I'd like to hand off to Tuli Utriainen. Um, she'll be working about, talking about the design process. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to start by saying that Gotzi Move Guys, uh, designers from a design school organizing a design-a-thon, and you're asking a person from CERN to talk about the design process. And I would just like to take a moment and remind you that I come from an institution that has produced this slide <laughs> in order to let the world know about the discovery of the Higgs boson. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just let that seep in for a moment. Uh, luckily, what we do is not only fantastic slide design, we do a lot of physics. We have around 10,000 physicists and engineers working together, producing some of the most intricate, complex uh, technology that the humankind has ever made. This is the Atlas detector. 40 million collisions happen there every second. And this weird construction is used to actually prove or disprove physics theorems. However, some of the technology also ends up being an application for the world. And as you can see here, this is a PET scanner that's commonly used in hospitals. Uh, however, this process is serendipitous and it can take a long while. So, what we're doing now is a new experiment is we're inviting people from different disciplines, designing, engineering, architects, uh, and artists to actually work on societal challenges together and then to see if we could actually apply the technology in a faster way uh, for societal needs. And this is my home where I live at CERN, Idea Square. And it's a smaller space than you guys have here, but it also has workshops, uh, rapid prototyping tools, and things that help people actually implement their design ideas. And to go back to the design process, this is something that it might look like. So uh, this is a process from Larry Leifer. You start with redefining the problem. You do some benchmarking ideation, testing, building, and this is what the process looks like in theory. Now this is what the process might look like in practice, because when you start doing something, you might discover that, okay, somebody already implemented it in one way, and then you need to go back, and then you do a little bit testing, and then you go back to redefinition, and it's all kind of a mashup. I think the more projects you do, the more you kind of learn to pivot as you discover new things. 
and there's research done on the processes and one of the things I would advise you to do throughout the weekend is to shift between the modes. So don't only do one day ideation and then one day building. Um, Michael Hlande actually went through the work of around 10 teams uh, and mapped out their process. And the teams who shifted between modes more actually got a better grade and a better outcome. So I advise you to do the same. And also design is actually about people. So Malte Jung did a research where he mapped video material of team interaction and used the exact same methods it used by psychologists to determine whether a couple will divorce or stay together. And he discovered the couples or the team members who didn't go through a divorce by prediction actually produced way better project outcomes. So think about your team members this weekend as you would think about your spouse and try to stay positive. And if you disagree, do it gently. And then what kind of difference does testing make? We often say test often. And how many of you has done the egg drop challenge ever? Anyone? Couple? Okay, so the egg drop challenge is an exercise where you design a shelter for an egg and you let it fall and then you measure the distance how uh, high you can drop the egg without breaking it. And by measuring the outcome of the designs that were tested and the designs that were not tested, you could actually see a difference in the height. So the designs that were not tested lasted for 70 centimeters and the rest actually made it up to 175. And also, how tall the designers before the dropping said that their design would make it, their confidence in the height went up 44%, which is not bad. So, even if you have a short time, testing pays off. Test your ideas. And then, if you look at design not as a process, but as a set of behaviors, we did a small research on what kind of behavior is hardest. You have to ideate, make decisions, prototype, do all these things. So we looked into these nine different modes. So there's redefining the problem, grasping external knowledge, like doing benchmarking and need finding, knowledge pooling, sharing what you know with different team members and so on. And we actually found out that uh, testing and user feedback was most challenging for people. Then after that, redefining the problem. So making sure that you're actually working on the correct or right problem that's relevant. And last, grasping external knowledge. So making sure that your project has real world connection. And tonight and throughout the weekend, you have a lot of people available. Uh, so make sure that you help out different people and use their brains and lend yours. And this is a picture from a strange event in the desert, Burning Man. I don't know if you've been there or know about it. But it's a weird thing where for a week, entire week, money stops to exist. You cannot buy absolutely anything. You bring everything you have, and instead of thinking about what can you get, you think about what can you give. So I highly, highly invite every one of you to think about what you can give to your team, to the other teams, uh, whatever it is, a smile, your knowledge, your skills, and uh, I think it's gonna be a really, really cool event. And if you have any questions, please come and talk to me. I'm also available throughout the weekend. And that's it. Thank you, Tuli.
Right, okay. Is everyone still here? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to dive into the topic introduction. Um, you might have read something on the web page, what it might be about. Um, it's essentially this wall of text. Um, but it's a bit less. It's, um, it's about new work and how we shape our future work life, our working space, and how new technologies and how globalization, work-life balance, how everything is interconnected and how especially new technologies and globalization affect our working pace, how we work, where we work, and how often we work. Work-life balance is not easy to maintain these days, except maybe for digital nomads who are chilling on beaches working remotely. Does anyone know digital nomads? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, just quickly, a digital nomad is someone who travels the world and uses, essentially uses technology to um, work from anywhere he wants because he's not bound by physical infrastructure. Um, but what do, what do these terms mean and how do we deal with those, those issues with burnout and how can we maybe come away or how can we embrace 24-7 societies? We think that by choosing the topic new work, we give you something to, a topic to shape how we in the future want to work. And we think it's really important that this topic gets more attention and that we, we have the chance to actually work on this. So, what will, you, what would, will the motivation be to go to work in the future? Will it be money? Will it be creativity, self-fulfillment? Will it just be meaningful action? So how can we make this world maybe a better place, less, have less burnouts, have less stressed people? I'm sure you know this. I mean, all, essentially not for the environment, which is, I think, something where we care most about currently, but also for us for yourself. We have a responsibility and we want to give you this task to take on this topic and to be bold, to propose answers and to raise questions, to engage with this topic and this will be the topic. New work. Right. So Tuli, why don't you come up? Um, so Tuli and me, we're going to do a speed brainstorming. So, as a first task, I want you to reach down your goodie bag, grab a pen, grab your post-its, and if someone doesn't have a goodie bag, you might get someone from the person next to you, some from the person next to you. Okay. So, I'll let you start now, keep your ideas, Write them down, draw your ideas until the song finishes. So, does everyone have a few ideas? Do you need more time? Okay. Well, the hardest part is done. Now, it's all about sharing with the person next to you. Turn to someone next to you and share the ideas. Come up with your favorite two joint ideas. <coughs> we'll give you another three minutes to do this. And in the end, you should have two ideas you find best. Four people now. 
So make sure you join, and then you're into groups of four, and then again, decide on the group's favorite two ideas. Okay? So get together if you have to move around. Teams of four. Three minutes. And also remember to introduce each other, because this is also about meeting people, not only about the ideas. Existence. So through Skype, through Facebook, through Dropbox, through the internet in general, I'm always connected with my friends, my family, and of course if I want or not work. Of course this more or less only apply right now for jobs which can be done by a computer, but again through the internet location becomes kind of insignificant. So, um, Digital Nomad is kind of a person who uses technology, particularly wireless networking, to work and live without uh, requiring a fixed location. It doesn't matter really if your client sits here in Switzerland and you are on a heavenly beach or in a Starbucks in a trending city, which is probably almost an impossible dream setup or a Hollywood movie but co-working spaces become more and more normal. There is right now a really nice community of digital nomads out there, um, and they gather actually around right now on a site called nomadlist.com, where they share their concerns, discuss their problems, and talk about great places to work and live. And I think it's a really nice starting point to think about what could be a new place or theme for work and one of the interesting questions they have is actually, when I live here but I work for another country, where do I actually have to pay my taxes? I have this problem right now. And one of the most um, discussed topic right now is actually which is the best backpack to take with you? So this brings me to my second point. What are the actual needs today of a digital nomad? What does he or she need in her backpack? Well, even if everything becomes wireless, today my true friend and enemy actually is battery life. The battery life determines my flow and I believe almost everyone here can relate to the feeling when you stand somewhere out of nowhere on a train station without a battery and have no clue which is the best connection to go home now. So, a charged battery became, becomes kind of necessary today and during my journey I captured a lot of those moments like here at the World Expo in Milano where a guy sits outside and all these crazy things happening around him and he used that power socket I desperately need. So, or here we have some pictures I found after the Hurricane Sandy in New York where actually charging phone becomes also kind of a news desk or kind of creates a community and actually shows how important being connected today is. So my, smart, my laptop and especially my smartphone are my traveling companions today. Through them I'm constantly connected. My knowledge and my connections to my environment are floating in this cloud over me. Now I'm free to move. So. The only thing that's still buying me is my nightly ritual to charge my goddamn phone. Every night before I go to bed, I have to make sure that the alarm is set and that my phone is charging. 
even if there are millions of power sockets out there and even if battery life starts to get actually better, I ask myself how can I become more independent from those power sockets. So the nightly charging ritual. So the nightly charging is actually kind of a ritual and I ask myself is it also kind of maybe the ritual of a digital nomad? Is it a need? So what is a ritual? Um, is it a habit or is it a ritual? A ritual gives you identity. A ritual helps you establish order and structure in, a, in your daily life. And as a digital nomad, you actually kind of start to struggle with some questions where, like, where actually is my home? So I ask myself, can I make myself more about, more aware of this digital world, world I constantly live in? So this came part of my project called IMTI, the act of charging as a ritual of the digital nomad. IMTI is my attempt to become aware of dependence from my smartphone. And I started my research with, um, uh, during my research I stumbled across a movie, which I want to show you. Well, that was Tom Hanks alone on this heavenly island, stranded and lost and screaming, I have made fire. And fire is some way today a pillar of our existence. This spark, fire, is kind of the key element who makes us to what we are today. And so I wanted actually to scream, I have made my own electricity. And in the Greek mythology, it was Prometheus who stole the fire from the gods and gave us the possibility to be free again and to cut the cord from them. So I thought, I need to make a fire. So I started to drill a fire like Tom Hanks. Well, more than half an hour and a really intense workout later, actually that matter became alive. That was not that fire, mine was that size. Well, but I have made my own fire. I, and I have to say it was kind of a really big satisfaction. This feeling you have of independence, this power, this feeling of you can do whatever you want, you can take over the world, you can rule the world. So I wanted to take that feeling, this I have made fire into my work and I want you to showcase this video about my project. So, MT is a way to charge a smartphone without the power socket. To become self-aware that electricity doesn't just come out of the power socket. To ask 
yourself what does actually 1% of power or battery means to you or to me. What am I willing to invest or to give up for this freedom I get through this device? And during my process and my research about rituals, the history of us and my confrontation to generate electricity, I had to realize that as something as simple as this or as I thought it is, it kind of becomes a more difficult problem than I thought. For instance, I wanted to work just with a dynamo and take this idea, but with today's gadgets, it's a bit more complicated than I thought. For example, there are some really interesting, annoying security mechanisms in today's gadgets, which doesn't really want to allow you to charge. And so I had to get kind of innovative. Thank you, Apple. And I really like, so I really like the metaphor of fire, but I didn't want it to close myself too much, too much. So I had to make another um, prototype, and I decided to create another one with a drill chuck. So now I was able to not only generate electricity through myself, I could also start to get out there and find other sources. I can now attach a water or wind wheel. I can steal now electri like from every rotating object, like a parasite. I found electricity now far away. And I was kind of able to live as a digital nomad. Well, of course, this is the concept. And of course, I can see why some people on the internet think this is the most hipster way to charge a phone. <laughs> Yes, it could be even more efficient. Yes, I know there are solar cells. And yes, I know it could be even more practical or work more efficient. But my attention behind it was more to start a dialogue with it. And so I see this talk also kind of as a possibility to share some feedback I got when I could exhibit it. And in the beginning, I simply just wanted to start my phone. But in the end, for me, was the discussion which made it really nice for me and I get a lot out of it. When I showed people my project, they all could really relate to this problem standing somewhere without electricity or running out of battery. And they all were kind of excited to charge a phone in an exhibition. And they also get kind of ambitious to charge their phone, and they were kind of really surprised how long it actually takes. Off topic, it takes, depending on phone, to two to three minutes for one percent. But if they actually reach this one percent, it was kind of a lot of what I got back. It gave them a bit more satisfaction. So they actually started to value this one percent of battery life more than one from a power socket. And overall, all those encounters were the ones which stuck to me. And there was, for instance, a small boy, boy, and he was charging for around 20 minutes his mom's phone. I think he would never do that or never thought about that before. Then there was, of course, an old man who told me, you know, oh, people have to know that battery, like electricity, just doesn't come out of the power socket. And then there was a dad which could not believe that we are still able to create the fire with our own hands. But he was sure that he had to learn this, uh, his kids. So empty is a way, or empty is a way to charge a phone without a power socket, to become self-aware that electricity doesn't just come from the power socket, to ask it, oh, I've switched. Okay, sorry. Uh, for me it was, for me, it was the idea to find another approach to charge my phone, to get more independent. But I had to realize that even if I ran out of power so often, I was one of those who believed that electricity was omnipresent. I was one of those who never really questioned this availability till I made this project. And it was kind of shocked how much effort I have to input it to get something out of it. And that I actually live in a world today which kind of deliver you a dream of freedom which you are not really able to achieve. 
So I made myself a way to charge my phone, but I cannot really be independent today. So I just want to sum up shortly. Um, smartphones are today our constant travel companions. Through our smartphones, we are free, but we are never alone. We can, can become nomadic again, and since the creation of fire, it was always about this balance between uh, the pleasure we get from things or devices and the pleasure we get from freedom from those. So my goal was to become more aware of this dependence of the smartphones, their battery, and to at least make me think, do I really need to reach, to be reachable all the time? I don't really consider myself anymore as a true digital nomad, but I'm still really like the idea behind it, and I'm kind of fascinated of people who really live this life. But I hope I could inspire you with a different of approach, what or how or where we could work, and what kind of new problems we could face in this case. So I thank you very much for your patience, and I hope you may not run out of battery through the next 48 hours. Do you want to take any questions? Yeah, if someone has a question. Yeah, does anyone have a question? For Ramon? Okay. So, thank you again so much. Really good presentation. So, next up. Um, we'll have Stefan Pops from Wire talking about innovation. Um. Hello, good evening, welcome to the near future, a future where um, dogs will play a major role or you know, a future where um, smart machines will play a major role, uh, smart algorithms will play a major role and even robots will play a major role. But uh, we all know that the future, uh, we, we can't make a clear forecast for the future so we um, what we have seen in the video was that the future will come up with some um, uh, outcomes we didn't expect. And that's why um, I want to talk about today a little bit about uh, rethinking innovation in the age of acceleration because I think acceleration is a thing we all know. We all know it because of the uh, smart devices our friends from Google are developing. And uh, I think we have to rethink innovation in this, uh, in this context. Um, I, I, I've seen I have 30 slides, uh, way too much. I think this will be a Dada keynote and I will add some Dada English. So I hope it will be uh, interesting for you and not too confusing. Just a few words uh, on my person. My name is Stefan. Uh, I uh, studied philosophy and physics. 
um, after that I did a um, design thinking uh, program and uh, I'm working as a writer and I'm working for WIRE. WIRE is a think tank based in Zurich. Um, we are a, an interdisciplinary team. We work at the interface between uh, science and society. We uh, uh, publish books, uh, maybe you've seen the abstract series twice a year. Uh, next week we'll come up with a book uh, which is called Hacking Healthcare. We uh, do keynotes, we do workshops, and we do, because we also love money, we do consulting. But we do good consulting for good companies. Um, yes, now it's working. Um, if we look at the present, I think we often already have the feeling that we are living in a science fiction movie. Uh, thanks to the guys from Google and Apple, we have uh, things in our pocket which 10 years ago we needed a truck to carry around. And this is this developments are, are tremendous, but um, I think beside all the science fiction things uh, that are happening, we also have to focus on the things that don't change or that uh, Ch just change very slowly and I'm talking about uh, personal needs and personal wishes so I as a recommendation as you are you are very free for uh, technical developments but also be aware of the things that never change I will go through uh, this doesn't work through the presentation in three steps. I will talk about specialization and the next industrial revolution. The next industrial revolution means artificial intelligence. Um, the second point will be the dilemma of acceleration, uh, which means I will talk about the fact that we are building smart devices, doing things faster than ever before, but unfortunately we are still uh, living, uh, we're still um, facing a lack of time. And the third part will be about um, how to do future innovation and maybe I can give you some inspirations for the next 48 hours. So, uh, before we start with computer love, I think, no, I will go directly to the next slide. Uh, humans have developed a great way of dealing with the complexity of the world. Since the era of enlightenment, we decided to cut the world into pieces. We make small parts of the world because they are much easier to understand. And this leads to that great productivity. When we focus on one aspect in the world, we can do it really, really fast. And when we connect all these parts together, we can build up great products in a very fast way. This is very, yeah. And we, we started this in the first industrial revolution. Uh, producing a product was divided into very small pieces so machines could do uh, could replace the work that humans were doing that's the other side of the coin um, fragmentation we are already living on very very small islands we know that especially in universities I've been to ETH uh, lately they have now a, a department which is just um, doing research on on uh, stairs. Ten people uh, doing research on stairs, part of the architecture department. It's really, it's cool stuff, but you know, it's, uh, you, they, they, they have really their own language and it, it becomes harder and harder to understand what these guys on the other islands are really doing. And for me the most uh, crucial problem is when I need to know something about stairs, I, of course, I asked the guys on the island of stairs and I have to trust them because I don't understand the language. Uh, yeah. That's the negative side of the uh, specialization um, coin. So, and of course, our goal should be to, to, to uh, rewind this kind of uh, fragmentation. Because we all know when we focus on something too strong, something might appear that will hit us. <laughs> and that, this is what's happening to a lot of scientists. They are really, really good in their, uh, in their topic, but uh, yeah, and it's happening again and again and again. So um, yeah, just stay open for other ideas. So, okay, enough. Um, 
this brings me to the next point because I think uh, specialization was one of the fundamentals for the first industrial revolution. When we decided to divide a production process into smaller pieces, we were able to build machines that do one step in the production line. And today, we also, like we have seen, we, we, we are doing research in very focused uh, special fields. This is now the time for smart machines to, to um, I don't know, to, 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 uh, to help us or to even re replace us in the things we are doing. And now we have to think about the, the, um, the areas where robots or smart machines can actually replace us. And I'm pretty sure that it's all about rationality. 100 years ago, the machines replaced our muscles. This was no problem. We knew that there were other animals on the planet that are much stronger. But today, with I think uh, the unique selling point of humans is really rationality. And now there will be algorithms and, and smart machines that are even faster. I think this will be a very uh, tough uh, challenge for our self-understanding. But I'm pretty sure, yeah, smart machines or al algorithms will change our healthcare system, our, our banking system, the way we learn, the way we teach, a lot of stuff. But I want to ask a few questions on, on the age of uh, digitalization. Three questions I think are very important to, to, to get an opinion in this development. The first thing is how moral can algorithms be? Because I'm pretty sure that algorithms will have to make decisions in the future that have a moral um, aspect. The second question is, what work will humans do? Or, yeah, I think, let's say uh, half of our jobs will be replaced by, by algorithms. What will we do? I don't know. This I will explain to you later. And the third one is, what will happen to the speed of our life? Will it go on getting faster and faster, accelerating, or will it slow down? These are the three questions I think we should talk about. The first is on morals, and I think there is no better uh, example to talk on morals than on um, self-driving cars. <laughs> because, let's say, in, uh, Google says 2025, uh, I don't know, half, no, I think 2025, half of the cars on the road will be self-driving. Stop. Um, and this will lead to 80% less accidents than before. This is a very, very, uh, these are very good news, but there will be accidents. Just, uh, uh, yeah, let your fantasy uh, flow. You are driving in your autonomous car in the beautiful Swiss mountains. You're doing a massage to your feet, and then suddenly around the corner comes a group of uh, bikers. And yeah, if your car doesn't react at all, 30 people will get killed. If he crashes into the group, but with a, some kind of strategy, 15 people will get killed, or he could drive your own car down. You would be killed, but just one person. So this will be decisions cars will have to make in the future. And we, have, we don't really have a, a solution for that. The, the, the crazy thing will be that the decision the car makes will be made by a computer specialist maybe one and a half years before the situation really occurs. And um, the second, uh, there are a lot of guys around who think artificial intelligence will solve that problem. I think this won't happen. Um, last, last month, an um, algorithm solved and very, uh, solved and very old mathematical problem. It's called the Erzdiskrepanz pro problem. It's a problem which exists for now 60 years and an algorithm came up with a solution. And he said, yes, I solved the problem. The problem for us, for us humans, is the solution of the problem, the length of the solution is longer than the whole Wikipedia. So it's very hard for us you, humans to reconstruct the solution of the algorithm. So this will be very hard. We won't, these machines will make decisions and we won't be able to reconstruct their decisions. So we have to ensure a high quality education, which means, yeah, I don't know. We have to teach artificial intelligence, but we are not uh, sure so far how this will work. So, second problem. 
what jobs will we lose? This is a, a, a study from the Economist from last year. One means your job will uh, be replaced by an algorithm in the next 20 years, for sure. Here, it's not so sure. Telemarketers, retail salespersons, economists, and there, this is pretty interesting, uh, you can see right now, half of all attorneys or law experts will lose their job. So, congrats to your choice here. Design is a very, I think, creativity will be a human, uh, unique selling point for quite some time. But if you have friends who are studying law, maybe you could talk to them just, uh, yeah. Because it's about laws, it's about texts, and of course, algorithms are able to scan these texts and to, to uh, yeah, to, to do the rational part. Um, I think here also what's missing is barkeepers. I was a barkeeper in Zurich. Barkeeper won't be uh, removed by smart machines, but also dentists or all, all the parts where empathy plays a major role won't be um, replaced by machines. So what will we do? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that we won't end up like this. It's a pretty interesting uh, uh, scenario. And of course, we could, we should really think about the bedingungsloses uh, Grundeinkommen. How do you say uh, unconditional cash? And <laughs> so, um, I think the, the the second machine age will really be a, a, um, a chance for us to find out what we can do better than machines. And I'm pretty sure that all this creativity stuff, things like empathy. Finding solutions in, in um, how, how, what did I, unclear situations when, when we don't know which uh, um, numbers we have to add to, to find the solutions, I think people will still be much better than algorithms. Third question, what happens to our feeling of acceleration? <laughs> yeah, I have a, an opinion and the opinion is clear. Oh, shit. Nine, nine. Sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sure our feeling of acceleration will go on. This, this are bad news, but it will happen because when we look at the past, since model, model uh, how do you say modernity, modernity started, um, the feeling of acceleration has grown, and we just have the past to look in the future, and I, I don't see any reason why, why anything should slow down. And we should, I will show you now a video that we should take good choices how to react on acceleration because... When your cable goes out, you get stressed. When you get stressed, you need to get away. When you need to get away, you go for something exotic. When you go for something exotic, you get bitten by something exotic. When you get bitten by something exotic, things swell up. When things swell up, you can't go home. And when you can't go home, you become a local fisherman they call Big Fatty Face. Don't become a local fisherman they call Big Fatty Face. Get rid of cable, eh? So, I think, um, yeah, we, we, we really have to think uh, um, pretty carefully uh, about our reactions on acceleration. So, that leads me to the second part of the presentation. The dilemma of acceleration. It sounds pretty simple, but I, 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 yeah, when I was preparing the presentation, I thought, yep, I will tell you what I thought. Um, technological innovations help us to save time. This is true. Writing emails is faster than writing letters. Washing machine washes the clothes faster than by hand. Driving with a car is faster than going by feet. Mm? That's correct. So, normally all the time that has been saved by a machine should be now uh, there for my uh, use. But that's not a fact. Uh, that's, that's not happening. And why is that? It's not the technological pro uh, uh, tools. They are not guilty because they save time. There must be a different driver. So that's, I think when we, when we talk about acceleration, we always think about the new iPhone 6S, faster, faster. 
But um, I think this can't be the driver of acceleration. I think there are two drivers. And the first is our economic system. Because our economic system is uh, built on growth, which means we can only guarantee a stable uh, level of, of wealth when we grow, when our economy is growing. And growing means producing in the same amount of time more things. And this means acceleration. So, uh, anti-capitalist, we have to rethink our economic system. This is the first reason why our world is accelerating or why our feeling the world is accelerating exists. The second one comes from the inside. And this is a more philosophical uh, uh, view on the situation because I think today we are really, really focusing on, on the time we have on this planet Earth. We rarely think about our death and we yeah, we, we, we don't really think about the time after death. So we concentrate on the time we have here. We want to live a full life with a lot of experiences. And yeah, we need more experiences to have a full life. So in order to find a substitute for eternity, we try to do more things faster. And yeah, that's the idea behind the argument. <laughs> so what should we do? Actually, I don't know what we should do, but I know what we should not do. I think slowing down can't solve our lack of time. Slowing down won't be any solution because, yeah, there are two reasons. Um, of course, each one of us could go to a mountain and, and uh, disconnect everything, uh, throw away the smartphone. This is, a, uh, this is an illusion. Or, yeah, maybe you could do it, but uh, this, this is not a solution for the whole society. Time is not a product like fair trade bananas. This is what... Uh, I, I really think if everybody is buying fair trade bananas, the economy will change to sell more fair trade bananas. This is good and this is true. But if each one of us is uh, slowing down a little bit, this won't slow down the whole uh, situation because time is not an extra dimension. Time is connected to everything we do. So, yeah, again, we have to uh, rethink our economic system that uh, stands behind the situation. And the second reason why slowing down is no solution, this is a little bit s simpler, slower internet and slower emergency cars no, this wouldn't improve our lives. If we would slow down everything, this would be also a consequence. We have to find out where our relations to humans work and nature, where these things are stressed. So, third part. How should we do future innovation or how should you do future innovation? Yeah, uh, this is no, no surprise. We have to also to, to overcome this fragmentation uh, I was explaining before, we have to work interdisciplinary. This is a fact and everyone, everyone's talking about it, but we have to force it. I was talking in the beginning about design thinking. I'm not, uh, I did this seven years ago and I, I, I yeah. It was, the experience was okay. I didn't like the religious uh, style around it. But in the last years, I realized that, especially for people who are now for, in work for more than 30 years, these methodologies for interdisciplinary work are really <coughs> helpful to, to, yeah, to, to bring different, um, different, different things together, different uh, yeah, scientific approaches. So, go on do interdisciplinary work. The second, my second idea for the future of innovation is a bit, little bit more complex because when we think about innovation, we always think about technical innovation. We think about products that are successful on the market. This definition of, of innovation is 100 years old and 
when, when I ask you what is innovation, uh, tell me a, a thing, what, uh, an example of innovation, I think you will come with a microwave, a car, a smartphone, whatsoever, but you wouldn't say the microcredit system in um, India, for example. So, yeah, that's what I just said. We think of technology and this we have to change. We need a broader definition of innovation. Right now, with all these techniques like design thinking, we are always talking about personal needs, needs of the client. Yeah, that's interesting and helps us to create uh, uh, good products, but we have to break this up. We have to talk about, not just about individual needs, we have to talk about social needs, what the society wants. And this is what we have to discuss all together. And there's a new, new um, there's an, yeah, the, the social scientists are just working on a new definition of innovation which they call social innovation. And social innovation means that we lose the focus on products but, and instead of that we try to invent solutions that... Uh, 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 sorry. To, to that le lead to social change. I will just show you uh, uh, how it works. This is a, a, a process of a social innovation. It's pretty sim uh, similar to a design thinking process. We have here ideas, proposals, prototypes, testing, scaling, but at the end it doesn't stand a product which fits to a need of an individual person, but it's about systemic change. And this. It doesn't have to be a product, it could be a law, it could be a political um, thing, it could be a, a service, an idea. So we have to make the, our uh, definition of innovation a little bit broader. And then last but not least, that's what you all know, we have to prototype. And not just as a designer because you are already doing this. We have to prototype in politics, we have to prototype in, in, in bigger systems like, like states, we have to do it in, in, in uh, companies. You know, because our, our way of thinking and, and talking and arg finding arguments is much too slowly for the uh, accelerated times we're living in. So if we want to know if 14-year-old kids should be able to vote, we should try it. So just a short summary on the things I said, oh, here. Specialization has enabled deep knowledge and big inventions, but also leads to fragmentation. And then the second part of the first part was algorithms will change the way we work, but will help us to concentrate on exclusive human capabilities. The second part about acceleration says, acceleration is an eminent part of modernity. We have to identify where speed stresses people and rethink our concept of economic growth. And last point, global challenges require a new understanding of innovation. Social innovations that put social values in the center of the development process may lead to appropriate solutions. Yeah. <clears throat> and before I finish, a little bit advertisement. Two, two weeks old, we, uh, Wire has now an app on the App Store, um, it's called Wire Archives. You can read all the um, abstract uh, issues. We have now, I think it's 15, and our studies and books, yeah, you can download it. And that's it. Thank you. Do we have questions? Yes. Thank you. I thought this was very interesting. You were talking about the human capabilities. And uh, do you kind of invest any thoughts in, in uh, intuition or spirituality uh, as a creative kind of impact for new ideas? Decision making works, we don't know how creativity 
work, we don't know how spirituality works. These are all things we don't understand, so we can never teach it a machine. So this would be a very um, exclusive uh, part of life for humans. Is this? Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Um, thanks for your talk, it was very interesting. Uh, you said that the reducing and slowing down will not really help, and I was curious to know what you think about this new concept of working 21, 21 hours a week. I don't know if you... I, I've seen this TED talk on, uh, actually on the, on the mm -hmm. site, and there is this new concept that by reducing the number of uh, time that people work can uh, uh, have yeah. an impact. Go for it. I, I think uh, <laughs> less work, yeah, less work is uh, always good, but I think uh, the problem is not just we are, uh, not just our work is accelerating, also our private life is accelerating, and that's again the point. Uh, I don't care if I'm uh, stressed at work or at home. This it's, acceleration is a phenomenon that's overwhelming all these areas. But yeah, less work. That's very good. Okay, I think we have space for one more, one more question. Don't you think that it's an illusion uh, that we can cope with the acceleration uh, as human beings? Um, I, for myself, I think that uh, the, the economic way of our life and uh, the uh, acceleration will lead to a crash uh, sooner or later. It cannot go on for like 100 years. It will crash. I think I, there was one slide I, 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 did, I didn't, I, I, I erased. There's a new political philosophy which is called Accel Act it's so difficult accelerationismus. It's it's they are fighting against the the. Oh, no, it's uh, my English is too bad. Sorry, I can't explain that. But they are uh, ideas. Okay, I do it in German. Um, danke. Um, also es gibt tatsächlich die Überzeugung auch eben dieser philosophischen Richtung der Accelerationisten die davon ausgehen, dass Entschleunigung gerade auf der Ebene des, des Denkens, des Philosophierens absolut un, ungeeignet sind, um, was weiß ich, gegen NSA oder so äh, vorzugehen. Die einzige Chance ist, das Denken insofern so zu beschleunigen, um dem Kapitalismus eben eine, so, so einen Turbo-Boost zu verpassen, dass der Crash halt möglichst schnell dann irgendwie stattfindet. <lacht> also, ja, genau. Nein, also ich glaube, genau, äh, nein, ich sehe überhaupt keine, ich sehe da leider kein Licht am Ende. Nein, also das, wie auch, also genau, ich sehe überhaupt nie, ich habe nie eine Phase gesehen, seitdem die Menschen irgendwie äh, die Reagenzgläser erfunden haben, wo das irgendwie langsamer wird. Und Also wie, genau, also, äh, ja. Okay, thanks again. Another round of applause. So, well, I don't want it to start so dark into this weekend, but uh, we are the light. We have to kind of make a change. Um, let me just quickly find my slides. Right. Okay, wrap up. Um, so it was a really interesting round. I will quickly go into something different. And now we're back to what we want from you, or maybe what the requirements are. And first of all, we have a deadline on Sunday at 3. No, actually, actually this slide is incorrect. I'm most sorry. Um, <laughs> at 3.30, but this is kind of the recommended time when you're latest there to hand over your deliverable, whatever that may be. Um, so this, this is going to be at the starting desk. 
the Beamer is, yeah, whatever, HD. Um, and those are, those are things I'm more or less confident we can take in. I will be personally there at the desk starting from 12 on Sunday, receiving everything. So you can try it out on my laptop. You can try out whatever you want. You can even deliver just an image if you're going to do, I don't know, maybe act. I don't know. So really, we're, we're open to everything you can deliver. Um, it doesn't have to be any of those. It can be anything else. Um, this is just what will run on my laptop. <laughs> OK. So here, the correct time, the deadline. Deadline means dead, like dead. I'm not going to take anything after that time. OK? So make sure you're there a bit before, maybe, because there might just be a queue. Who knows? Um, so, but again, this is not what we want from you. We want, what we want from you is, and I showed this in the beginning, bold ideas. We want ideas from you. And it can be literally anything. It can be graphic design, it can be performance, it can be an object, it can be a concept. And we have seen so many interesting things now. I think you are inspired, I hope. So, a bit of admin. These are the pages. Actually, the info page just went online a few minutes ago. So <laughs> you can now actually get the information there. Um, the topic, in, topic page is actually something I really recommend to dive into the new work culture thing again a bit. Maybe compare what you receive now as an input to what we have on there. There's a few interesting talks that was already mentioned, 21-hour um, work week, et cetera. And now, yeah, um, maybe. I just want to put out some questions that might or might not help you. And starting with Google, we saw this whole workplace innovation and how you know, this is really something that is becoming important, providing an actual space to work in and providing a space to think. And how can we therefore design our workplace? How do we want to work together? And what implications does this have on our work path? work-life balance, or even on our self-fulfillment? And is maybe remote work something that might increase and increase? Then going on to digital nomadism with Ramon, um, what do our, looks, our lives look like when we don't have roots anymore? What if digital nomads, nomadism is the actual model for our future kind of work? And what is home then, suddenly? And where is home? You know, and how do we communicate? And what objects do we need for this new lifestyle? And more recently, innovation and acceleration. Um, I'll try to open it again. Um, how do we deal with this dilemma now? So we, as a designer, this week, designers, this weekend, how do we deal with this? And how do we maybe start answering those questions already raised? And what impacts do robotics and the ever-increasing accelerations have on our lives already right now? Not even maybe in the future, but already. Where do we see signs and how are they affecting our lives? And does technology actually give us time or does it just make us busy? Do we therefore want more of those regulating systems? Do we want to regulate those regulating systems? I don't know. And maybe just one thing I want to give, give to you, dare, be daring, have bold ideas. It's, it's really an open weekend and we, we can't stress this enough. It doesn't have to be always you know, the safe way. It can really be anything. Yeah, okay. So, Tuli, maybe we kind of prepared some inspiration, some last, last inspiration, one or two slides. Um, <laughs> One of them is a movie again. Was actually work. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I think it should be on. Could you do the music? I could. Well, 
First, um, I just have a few different framings for the future of work. And one is linked to tools and what kind of tools do we work with. Now there's a lot of talk about cell phones and laptops, but the future interfaces might look pretty interesting. So this is actually a water-based system where you submerge your hands into this pool and you can operate it from top and below. Um, now it's used for a gaming interface, but you can also use desktops and the interface is obviously a little bit different than a touch screen. And if you extrapolate from here, uh, and if you really, really believe something will happen in the future, let's say climate change, maybe water-based user interfaces will be more dominant if there's water everywhere, or you could even design a system uh, allowing you to commute in a world full of water. Who knows? There's also a lot of cool interfaces in the MIT Media Lab pages, Tangible Media Group, so you, you can go and Google if you want to do some benchmarking. Okay, that's it for tools. Then another, another theme that also came up is organization of work. So now you work for a company, especially if you're an engineer. Journalists and designers do more freelancing stuff in different projects. But what kind of ways are there to actually work differently together? There's a Kickstarter is funding projects, but what if you could outsource getting your team together and actually getting money out of your projects? This is an example from... Oh, are we recording? Hello, everybody. My name is Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and this is my production company, Hit Record. It's a little bit different than your typical Hollywood production company because anybody with the internet can come contribute to our collaborative projects, and this website is where we all come to make things together. We make short films, books, music, art, and our latest and greatest production is a television show. It's called Hit Record on TV. So if you're an artist of any kind, if you're a writer, a musician, a filmmaker, a photographer, a graphic artist, illustrator, animator, anything, come work with us. Or even if you just have a good eye and you want to give us your opinion on things, that's super useful. Or even if you just want to hang out and watch how it all comes together, you are welcome. But it's really fun if you join in. Okay, so you can be home, you can be doing whatever on a professional amateur level, and you can contribute to any one of the projects. You also get paid for those projects, so if any part of your illustration, music, whatever animation ends up in these projects, you get paid. And if you extrapolate from here, what if we could, I don't know, uh, come join 300,000 people to send a spaceship up? And you could contribute with seven bucks and being a, doing cleaning two hours a week or whatever it is that you can do, like some parts of the design or something completely different, marketing, money gathering. Um, there's, it's kind of crazy. What if we wouldn't need these big corporations anymore to make these huge uh, projects together? And then the third part is linked with the theme of robotics and body and mind and the difference between these elements and the connection. And this is kind of an old movie that gives out an idea of a different kind of world. Just watch a little bit of the trailer. Oh, sorry. Robotic human surrogates combine the durability of a machine with the grace and beauty of the human body, with most people living their lives. I think we'll start over again. Um, yeah, I, do. I think we do. Sneaky. Okay. Robotic human surrogates combine the durability of a machine with the grace and beauty of the human body. With most people living their lives through their surrogate selves, our world has become a safer place. Take a seat in your STEM chair. And just with the power of your mind, you can control your surrogate and send it out into the real world. 
You can live your life without limitations. You see what they see. Feel what they feel. And become anyone you want to be from the comfort and safety of your own home. You can finally live the life you've always dreamt of without any risk or danger to yourself. We are confronted with an unprecedented situation. Two people have died while connected to their surrogates. I think we may have Okay, and promise. things obviously go wrong from there because everything sounds to be too good anyway. Um, but here, all your senses and your motoric presence in the world has been outsourced to a surrogate. So there's actually a robot double living the life for you. And you can choose any kind of exterior you want. You can look like what you want. There would be probably no um, discrimination of any people who want to work at a company because they're gay or too fat or too short because your robotic self can look whatever you want it to look like. You can change gender, do whatever you want. So what will your body do in the future? And what's that relationship going to be? Also, going to the mind part of things, um, this seems quite outlandish at the moment, but like we heard before, people are getting very attached to their smartphones and laptops. Like uh, There's people who kind of get withdrawal symptoms if they don't have the tech with them. And what's going to be the first step? You can already externally stimulate your brain to be more creative. Some researchers are doing this. Um, maybe some very techy people will start to take some uh, implants in their brains just to boost their memory a little bit. Kind of like you upgrade a computer hardware. And then it's going to become more and more adapted. And where is this going to lead? No idea. So. Yeah. Get crazy. Yeah, so you can, you can extrapolate things to the maximum and just play around with what if this would happen what would follow. And don't take anything for granted. The other option is, you know, world economy goes to bits and pieces and everybody ends up being poor and we can't afford electricity. What does the future of work look like then? I don't know, it's up to you to decide what you want to imagine. Okay, yeah, so I think we're gonna wrap up now, actually wrap up. Um, are there any more questions? They can be content related, they can be related to the organization. After that, we're done. Yes? I was just wondering if we could can leave our stuff here at the school on our own. Uh, uh, on your desk. Responsibility, yeah. Well, yes, I mean, so you can. Of course, but it's just there. So, I mean, yes. I mean, an option you maybe, you could ask us to kind of maybe give it in so we can store it somewhere, but I'm not sure. If everyone does that, we're full. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but I mean, you can leave anything here. Um, we're open 48 hours, so to speak, so it's not 48 hours anymore. Um, but, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question. Um, it's quite a pity. We thought we didn't have time before, but there are all these ideas up on the walls. I know it might be a little bit intimidating now when you've been hearing all these crazy things and interesting talks, but I would be very interested for one person from each group to just come over and shortly tell what's on the paper. Are you with me? Like, I would really want to do that. Do you want to do that too? <laughs> I think we should do it. Come on. It's like collective knowledge. Uh, okay. Maybe we can down the sheet to the dinner and do it there? Yeah, no? yeah no, okay. Me? So I think I, I got a message before that at quarter past, that is three minutes ago, we'll have food outside. And food outside is waiting outside for you guys. Um, so I think we can arrange this ourselves out there. So um, yeah, I mean, I guess then it's upper time. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone.